Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Manitoba Museum's International Astronomy Day and Manitoba Week event. My name is Scott Young. I am the Planetarium Astronomer at the Manitoba Museum. I'll be your host for this evening. We have a two-part broadcast today. We have the early version starting right now till about 07.45 or so. We'll take a little bit of a break and then we'll come back right around sunset. With any luck, the sky will clear here and we'll be able to see some local uh, live images. Otherwise, we'll be tuning into some of our partners across the country. As it is International Astronomy Day, there are astronomers all over the world that are bringing out their telescopes virtually, showing people the moon, the sun, the planets, and things like that. And so we'll tie into a number of those events as well. Many of these events are available to you online, and I'll pop some links in during the break, and you can check some of them out. One of my favorite ones is, uh, is going to be coming out of Victoria later on this evening from the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory. That's where they have the 72-inch Plaskett Telescope, which is a beautiful um, old telescope from, you know, a hundred years ago or so, uh, still functions really, really well. They're going to be doing some live observing through that. So there's a chance to see through one of the biggest telescopes in Canada. For a while, it was the largest telescope in, in Canada. That's coming from the center of the universe, which is the name of their science center that they have attached to the, uh, to the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory. Uh, I'm sure that there are folks in Toronto that wish that they had thought of that name first because that's the, uh, that's the Toronto moniker as well. But anyway, that's going to be coming up. There's also some stuff coming from the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, which is basically a national astronomy club. They're going to be doing uh, events from across the country. There's a group in Montreal, a group in Ottawa that are doing some talks and things like that. So I'll pop those links into the uh, chats during the break and you can check them out as well throughout the course of the evening. Now, right now, here in Winnipeg, mission control for, uh, for the museum's activities, it just started raining. And while that is extremely welcome, it's been really, really dry here, we can't really see through the rain and the clouds with our telescopes. So my car is packed with all the gear and as soon as it looks like there'll be a clear spot nearby, we will try and set up. We may be clouded out. And that's okay, though. We have plenty of images and plenty of things to talk about. Um, the chat, if you're on the Zoom call, the chat is open. Please, uh, you know, ask us any questions that you might have. This is a good chance to ask an astronomer. And um, if you want to know things about things that are up in the sky. We're going to use uh, some pre-recorded images and a simulated sky, a planetarium sky essentially, to show you what's up in the sky right now for this first portion. And then depending on the weather and depending on the uh, weather across the country, we'll bring you some live images in the second portion of the broadcast. We really are hoping to see Mercury, Venus, and Mars, as well as the moon tonight. So that's uh, pretty exciting. Great to see, uh, great to see some of our regular friends from uh, our regular program Dome at Home. For those of you that don't know, every Thursday night at seven o'clock, the Planetarium does a live astronomy show, and uh, it's called Dome at Home. It's here on Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube, and we just talk about what's up in the sky. Uh, my colleague Mike and I just get together and and chat about what's in the sky. We go through uh, usually there's sort of a feature each each week where we talk about. Uh, last night was the sun. And uh, we talk about space news, cool space stuff, check in with the Mars rovers and all that kind of stuff. So you can join us Thursdays at 7 for that. And uh, let's see, I think we'll, uh, we'll jump into some video over here. Normally on Astronomy Day, we actually will show people the sun through telescopes. Now, most of the time I will say, do not look at the sun through a telescope because the sun is so bright even without a telescope, you can damage your eyes permanently. If you look through a, a telescope at the sun, you will instantly blind yourself. However, there are safe ways to do it. You just have to have the appropriate gear, the appropriate knowledge, and so on. And so um, I have a telescope like that. The planetarium has a, a solar telescope. And so a couple of days ago, just on the off chance we'd have cloudy skies, I took some of these images of the sun. This is what the sun looks like up close. The sun is a mass of incandescent gas, as our friends, they might be giants, would say. I guess it's a 
It's a miasma of incandescent plasma. I think they revised the song because technically the sun is not incandescent. Anyway, um, the sun is a star. It's a nuclear reactor that is giving off all sorts of heat and light. And when you look at it through appropriately filtered telescopes, you can see all sorts of interesting things. The surface of the sun kind of has these bubbles all over it. It's almost like porridge that is bubbling up on the stove and a little bubble comes up here and a little bubble comes up here and so on. It's got flames sticking off the sides. You can see way over there on the left edge, there's a couple of big red flames that are sort of um, looping away from the sun. Those are called prominences. And we can see those with specially filtered telescopes. Just to give you a sense of scale, those prominences there are each longer than the planet Earth is wide. So that tells you how small the Earth is compared to the sun. This, uh, this views that we're seeing here, this is all through the same telescope. And the only thing that I've been changing has been the exposure on the camera because some of the things are bright, some of the things are faint, and you have to take sort of a bunch of different pictures to be able to um, capture all of those details. There are those folks that will take all those images and layer them together in Photoshop and give you a really great view. But unfortunately, uh, that that person isn't me. I'm not that, uh, that good at uh, that kind of image processing. But regardless, looking through a telescope like this is uh, a pretty cool thing to do. And soon, with... Uh, you know, with, with the vaccines kicking in and with hopefully cases will start going down, we'll be able to do some of these telescope events live like we used to, where we set up at a park and we do, or at the forks or something, and we set up our telescopes and you can actually look through it with your eye rather than having to depend on a, uh, a video view here. So, International Astronomy Day. During the day, usually a lot of fun stuff with the sun, and that's always a an entertaining thing to uh, to look at. I often will show people the power of the sun with a telescope. If you take a regular telescope and point it towards the sun, and then instead of putting your eye where the eyepiece goes, you put a, a piece of paper, the piece of paper bursts into flames instantly. Um, and that's what would happen to your eye if you were to look at a telescope, uh, at the sun with a telescope. So it's a pretty uh, dramatic demonstration of the power of the sun. And I mean, we've always kind of known that. We've known that the sun is the source of heat and light for the planet. Without it, it would be too cold for life to exist here. Without the sun, the earth would just fly off in a straight line off into space. It wouldn't have anything to orbit around because the sun's gravity is what keeps the, the planets all in order there. And people have watched and, and uh, revered the sun for thousands of years. You know, whether they, you know, almost every culture would name the sun something, thinking it was a god or goddess. There was usually a god of the sun. This is, uh, I think, Apollo here from the Greek tradition. There he is riding his chariot. And uh, the idea was that every day Apollo would ride his chariot across the sky, and that would be why the sun moved across the sky. Well, that's great. Now, nowadays, we have a bit better understanding of the, uh, of the sort of physics involved. You know, it's not the sun that's moving. It's actually our planet, the Earth, that is turning once a day. And as it turns, all the things out there in space look like they go moving by. But the concept of, you know, Apollo and his chariot or, you know, any of the other uh, ideas, they're still pretty cool in terms of... Um, people trying to understand how the world worked around them. You get, I mean, if you've ever seen the sunset, you know what kind of beauty the sun can bring. The sun is responsible for some of the most beautiful phenomenon in nature. Um, the beautiful sunrise and sunset, the visibility of the planets in the evening, the, the, the phases of the moon. When we look at the sun up close, we can see that the sun also has it's not a perfect sphere. It has uh, little dark spots on it. Astronomers, in a fit of poetic fancy, have named these spots on the sun sunspots. And uh, they're not terribly um, poetic to look at either. They are, there are just little dark spots on the sun. Most of the time, you can't see them unless you have a specially filtered telescope. Although, if you have some of those eclipse glasses kicking around from uh, a few years ago, 
um, you might want to pull those out and take a look with at the sun make sure there's no holes in them or anything they haven't got like a pinhole in them from from being in your uh, your junk drawer for a couple of years but those uh, filters will sometimes let you see some of the larger sunspots and as we look at them up close they're actually quite detailed little things on the sun they're not just a a simple dark spot there's like a a dark spot in the middle and then there's sort of a halo around it and sometimes there's multiple spots all together these are actually um indicators of energy of uh activity on the sun and so the more sunspots there are the more the more active the sun is there's again a, just a little scale to give you a sense there's the planet earth relative to those sunspots so we're pretty small so again, the sun gives us these beautiful phenomena. Tonight, if it was clear, we'd see the thin crescent moon up there with a uh, beautiful dot, which is the planet Mercury. That uh, This was a, a shot from last night, but was a, a, a nice view. We'd, we'd be able to see Mars, we'd be able to see Venus. Um, the full moon, when it's at its, its full phase, the super moon, all of that is because of the sun. The, the moon doesn't give off any light. There's no such thing as moonlight. The moon just reflects light from the sun. It's just a rock in space. And so, um, again, the sun is responsible for the beauty of a full moon night. When the sun and the moon get together, you get one of the most beautiful of all celestial events. Uh, you get a solar eclipse. When the moon passes directly in front of the sun, I took these pictures back in 2017 down in Nebraska. I drove down to there with my family to see the total solar eclipse. And it was a glorious sight. I, it was my second one. I, I saw my first one in 1979 here in Winnipeg when it came through. And that was the moment that I became an astronomer. And so it was really nice to go back, what, 30 odd years later and um, 40 odd years later. Ooh, wow. And uh, get a get another view of a of an eclipse it's such a beautiful sight that there are people that travel somewhere else in the world each year to see where the eclipse happens to be and and that's how they plan their tourism and they travel all over the place uh, obviously not so much this year now there is a solar eclipse coming up we will see a partial solar eclipse early on the morning of june the 10th and when i say early in the morning i mean like at sunrise, the sun will rise partially eclipsed and then the eclipse will end soon after. So it's not great for us here, but for the folks who are visible, who are in um, Northwestern Ontario, they'll have a great view because basically the, the moon will be right in the center of the sun, but the moon won't quite be close enough to be big enough to cover the whole sun. There'll be a little ring of sun still sticking out on the, uh, on the edges and that will be what's called a, a ring eclipse or an annular eclipse and so if you're in northwestern ontario or points farther north you'll be able to see that kind of event there were plans of course to go and drive to that area it's not all that far from winnipeg unfortunately the borders are closed and travel's not allowed so uh, we'll be watching it from here i'm going to be doing a live stream and uh, you'll have to join me really early in the morning or get up whenever you get up that day and you can watch it again on YouTube. You don't have, you don't have to watch it live. This is a picture by a former Win Winnipegger, Alan Dyer of that same eclipse. Uh, I show this mostly to show the difference between, you know, there's my picture and here's one of the best eclipse photographers in the world. Um, uh, you should check out Alan's site, amazingsky.com. He has a lot of really amazing images and he also has tutorials on how to use your camera to take pictures i mean everyone has a camera in their phone nowadays some people have uh, dslr cameras as well and you can use those to uh, take some amazing pictures of the sky and alan has a number of books and resources to help people do that so i highly recommend that as a resource sorry i'm trying to uh, narrate here and check in with all of our places across the country Looks like the folks farther east of us where it's already dark um, are cloudy as well. And so they're waiting for someone to have a, uh, a clear sky as well. So we may, uh, we may not get clear stuff for this first segment, but hopefully for the, uh, for the nine o'clock segment. 
Okay, let me see here. We've got a few, uh, just going to check in with our social media feeds here and see what we've got in terms of comments and questions. Um, oh, hey, we've got, uh, there's Stan Runge in Facebook there. He's a, a longtime member of the RASC, the Astronomy Club. And it is a great, uh, great to see you, Stan. He is um, able to uh, uh, answer some of the questions there. He's a longtime eclipse and solar observer as well. So um, yeah, if you do have those eclipse glasses, they, uh, the, the, the flimsy film that they're made out of, uh, Rob was commenting on, it looks like the mylar that is in like those helium balloons. But here's the thing, it's not the helium balloons. It's not, uh, it's a, a completely different material. So it's totally designed for solar observing. There's uh, a few other things that you can use, but those are for your eyes only. You can't put that in front of a telescope or anything like that. It, it's, uh, if you're using a telescope, you really have to have a lot of significant uh, gear. Okay, let's flip over to uh, our simulated view here. I guess I'll move the view. There we go. This is the sky right now from Winnipeg. I'm using a program called Stellarium. It is a free program that you can download and it basically simulates the nighttime sky from anywhere in the world and you can fast forward and rewind and so on. So I'm just gonna take the, uh, the time window down here so that we can see, uh, so we can fast forward to dark time. And so right now, here we are about, uh, I guess it's not the right time, there we go. It was not synced, so let me just sync this up to right now. There we go. Okay, so there's the sky as we uh, as we have it right now. The sun's still up. It will be setting over in the northwest. Up above that, we would see, and I'll zoom out here a little bit, way up there is the moon. Now, it just it looks like a dot. This is one of my problems with Stellarium. It looks like a big round circle until you zoom in enough, and then it switches over to the actual view. So here's the view of the moon that we would be having right now if it was clear here or in our other telescope sites. Uh, got a question here for, or a, a comment here from Ulrich. Uh, nice to see you Ulrich. There's uh, one of our regular Dome at Home viewers. He, he said we, uh, we put our eclipse cl get glasses in front of the camera and got good picture of the sun. So that's, uh, that's certainly doable if you're, as long as the lens of your camera, like in your phone or whatever, is smaller than the filter, as long as the filter covers the entire front of whatever you're looking through, it's fine. But it's gotta be at the front part. You can't put your glasses on here and then look through a telescope. It's gotta be right over the, the, the front. So yeah, you can definitely do that with your phone camera and that'll work really well. So here is, the the uh, the moon and it would it's a beautiful sight at this time of the of the night I'm just gonna set things up here oops there we go get rid of all these menus just a very thin crescent si phase the the this side here is lit up by the sun over here this is basically the nighttime side of the moon and so normally you, you would think well you can't see that because if the sun is really the only source of light out there, you'd only see this and this side will, would all be black. Well, it turns out that when the moon is in its crescent phase like this, there is another source of light, us, the earth. The earth and the moon basically see each other as opposites. So when we see the moon as a thin crescent, if you were on the moon, you would see the earth as sort of the opposite, almost a full earth with only a little bit of darkness. And the Earth, with its shiny clouds and shiny oceans and all that stuff, actually reflects quite a bit of light. And so that Earth reflection can actually shine back to the moon and light up this dark side a little bit. It's a beautiful phenomenon called Earth shine. And it means that you can actually see the dark side of the moon, regardless of what Pink Floyd had to say. That, uh, and it, it's beautiful in binoculars. So if it's not clear tonight, but tomorrow or the next night, try and get out and uh, check out the moon. If you have binoculars, it's a great view. If you don't have binoculars, still go out and see it with your eyes. You can, it's, it's a beautiful sight. Now, when we look at the moon, we see 
two different kinds of terrain, basically. There is the white stuff and the dark gray stuff. Back in the day, when we didn't know anything about the universe, really, uh, the people that looked at the sky sort of looked at the moon and thought, well, it must be kind of like the Earth. And so the gray flat areas, those must be oceans and seas. And the white areas, those are like the continents, just like there is here on the Earth. Well, not so much. The moon is just rock all the way around. But actually, these gray areas are kind of interesting. You'll see that the moon is covered with all these little round holes. Those are called craters. And each one comes from an asteroid that has basically flown through space, smashed into the moon, exploded, and left a hole behind. The moon is covered with these things. Some of those craters were actually so big, they made such big, deep holes that um, lava came up from underground through the hole and then filled in the crater. And so you get a crater like this where the whole thing has filled in with nice flat lava. And there's very few craters on that lava. That actually tells us something about the way the moon sort of was formed. There were all these impacts and craters early on but then after that, it must have slowed down a lot because we don't see a lot of craters that happened after those big lava ones happened. So you can actually use this to sort of figure out the age of things. Um, similarly, down here, you've got a couple of craters that do overlap the, uh, the seas and the maria. Let's see, um, right along the, the edge here where the light and the dark uh, meet, this line is called the terminator sounds ominous and Arnold Schwarzenegger robotic, but it's just the, the edge between light and dark. Um, and uh, let's see here. The, right along the Terminator here, there's a beautiful crater up here. This is called Atlas. Each of these craters, all the big ones, they're all named. Some after mythological creatures. And then back in the 50s and 60s, um, during the space race, the Soviets were the first to send a uh, a spacecraft around the back of the moon and they named a whole bunch of stuff after some of their political uh, heroes and social heroes and things like that and then all bets were off and pretty much there are craters named after all sorts of uh, people, scientists, literary heroes and things like that all over the place. But some of them are still named after mythological folks and uh, Atlas is right there and right next to it is Hercules. Just you can't even see the whole crater right now. In fact, all you can see is the sun shining on the, the one far rim. And for those of you that have ever seen the sun rising on the mountains, if you live near the mountains, I just saw something from, uh, from Melissa come by. Hi, Melissa and, uh, and Rowan, if you're out there. We, uh, if you've seen the, the sun come up and the mountains are lit, but it's still dark down in the valley where you are, that's what's happening there on the moon. Those crater walls are being lit by the sun, but it's still dark down in the valleys. So most of the craters are actually impact craters. So they're caused by asteroids. They do look a lot like volcanic craters, but there are very few volcanic craters on the moon. In fact, we don't think that there's really a lot of volcanic activity on the moon at all. There was, there was sort of lava in the center of the moon when it first formed, but that has long since solidified. So there's no lava in there, there's no volcano, volcanism, there's no plate tectonics or any of that cool geology stuff that, that happens here on the Earth. The moon was just too small and it, it cooled off and solidified all the way down to the middle. Excuse me. And so there's very little of the, uh, of the volcanism or volcanoes or anything like that. But the craters sure look like those classic sort of Hawaii cinder cones of, of volcanoes. And when they were first discovered, there was a huge debate about, are they volcanoes? Are they impact craters? Is there some mix? And it wasn't really until we were able to get to the moon with robots and then eventually with the Apollo astronauts, where they were able to figure out, you know, wow, the moon, the moon really, it doesn't have a magnetic field. So that means its central core is not uh, molten like the Earth's is. It, it, there, there were all sorts of scientific discoveries that basically told us that yeah, these are pretty much all impact craters. And once we knew that, that told us a whole lot about the formation of the solar system because basically these things crashing into each other, that's how the planets got made. And so this, this is like a, a crater museum. The moon 
It doesn't have any of those nasty things to erase craters. It doesn't have things like, um, you know, glaciers to grind down the craters. It doesn't have oceans to cover them up. It doesn't have uh, erosion or anything like that. It doesn't have any of that stuff. And so when a crater gets made on the moon, it's there forever unless another crater overlaps it. And so the moon basically is like a timeline of impacts for our solar system. So it's really, really valuable in that case. Okay, let's see. We saw a couple of other uh, questions go by. I wanted to get back to. Uh, Kyla was asking, where do you get eclipse glasses? That is a great question. Um, because of uh, COVID and things like that, the museum's gift shop is not operating or anything like that. And so we haven't been able to bring them in. Um, and it's quite hard to get them. There are some places um, that you might be able to get something equivalent, though. If you can go to a store that sells welding supplies, a number 14 welder's glass, which is like a, a I don't know, a four by five inch piece of glass that's supposed to go in your helmet, probably costs, I don't know, 25 bucks or something like that, and actually will work w even better than the, uh, than the Eclipse glasses. It's gotta be number 14 though. Can't be number 13 or 12. Number 14 is the only one that is certified safe. If that doesn't work, we're going to be doing a thing on Dome at Home in a week or so where we build a projection system where basically with either some magnifying glasses or a pair of binoculars, you can kind of make a little telescope slide projector that, that makes an image onto a piece of paper and that way you're totally safe. So we'll, if, if you want to see the, uh, the eclipse and you can't get eclipse glasses, um, tune into Dome at Home on Thursdays and we'll, uh, we'll provide that information. Okay, let me see here. We'll zoom out. The thing about today is that the moon is supposed to be pretty much right next to the planet Mars. Oh, I got to turn the menus back on. That's what happened. So what we're going to do here is I'm actually just going to fast forward a little bit and we will get to a, a point where it's a little bit darker and that way we'll be able to see what the planets will look like this evening. So let's get down here. Let's actually go to about nine o'clock. I'm gonna pause our real time. Like I say, this software is uh, free and downloadable. It's uh, from stellarium.org. So basically the, the up at the top of the screen there, if you go to that website, you can download this software for free and it does all sorts of really cool stuff. Whoa. So here is the view that we will have around nine o'clock when it's dark. There's the thin crescent moon we were looking at and right next to it is this little orange star. That's the planet Mars. 240 million kilometers away, way farther away than the moon. So it just looks like a dot, but that's where the Perseverance rover and the Ingenuity helicopter are all flying around and doing their thing. And uh, it's pretty, pretty cool to see with your own eyes from your backyard, this, uh, this place that we've been seeing all the details uh, online and so on. So it's, uh, it's nice to go out and see it. It's a, it would have been a good night because the moon really points the way to it. It's not very bright compared to the other stars. The moon or um, Mars has really kind of faded over the last little while. And like, here's another star over here that's quite a bit brighter. This is uh, a, a constellation star. This is the star Procyon. These are the stars Castor and Pollux, or Castor and Pollux in the constellation of Gemini, the twins. And that's basically, you know, the, the, the two stick figures of the two brothers from mythology that are twins. Now, this, this software, it's perfect because not only does it simulate everything, it even simulates some of the problems that people have when they are looking at the sky. For example, um, I wanted to see Venus and Mercury this evening as well. And it turns out that from my regular observing spot, Venus and Mercury are exactly behind a giant tree that is not on my property. And so I can't really do anything about it. So I'm just going to make a little change here to get rid of the tree. Uh, we won't do this in real life, of course. I'd rather keep trees around, but we can 
go to a nice, perfectly flat horizon and get a view here. Here are the other two planets that we would be able to see. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to see around uh, 930 or so, or nine o'clock, pardon me. The brightest one is Venus and it's really, really low. You have to go out right at nine o'clock basically and you have to have a nice flat horizon to be able to see it. I have yet to see it this, um, this season because it's just started to become visible and like I say, there's that tree. So, but up above it, not as bright, but still pretty bright, is another planet, the planet Mercury. And Mercury, I saw last night at about 10 o'clock. Um, it was up above the power lines across the way. I, met, I walked down a, a bit so I could avoid the tree. Uh, I didn't get there in time to see Venus, but I did see the planet Mercury. Now, Mercury is a hard planet to, to spot because it's the closest planet to the sun. And as all of these uh, planets go around the sun, there's, uh, this is the orbit of the, the planet Mercury as it goes around the sun, basically. It um, can never get very far from the sun. Here, we'll, we'll just get rid of the Earth here for a minute, sort of bring this up here. So there's the sun and there's Mercury's orbit as it goes back and forth. So it can only ever be that far from the sun. So you really need good conditions to be able to spot it. This is the best time. This is the best time this year to see Mercury. It's not always in May. It's, it, you know, it changes every year kind of thing, but it is the best time to see Mercury. And in fact, today is pretty much the very best night as well. But tomorrow, next night, the next night will all be almost as good. So if we don't get a chance to spot it tonight, you should be able to um, spot it over the next couple of nights. Go out nine o'clock, look off towards the northwest, and there are a few objects. There's Venus down there, there's Mercury, there's this bright star up high here called Capella, and then Mars is over here. The moon moves every night. So, for example, last night it was there, halfway between Mercury and Mars. The night before it was right beside Mercury and the night before that it was actually right beside Venus and you might have seen some of the uh, some of the pictures that came out it was the that that appearance of the moon marked the end of Ramadan and so uh, our Muslim friends um, were watching that moon specifically because the calendar is based on when the thin crescent moon first becomes visible. But each night the moon moves quite far across the sky. So by tomorrow, it'll be way up here near Castor and Pollux. And by the next time, uh, by the next night, it'll be way over here. So the moon is always changing, always moving around. Um, and boy, we have a, a bunch of questions coming in here on Facebook that I have been negligent in getting to. I apologize for that. I'm trying to monitor all these, all these things here. Um, let's see what we've got here. Um, Okay, let's see. Yeah, so there's some discussion about the uh, the eclipse glasses, and uh, uh, I'm I'm gonna have to set, say that uh, the Stan is right on this one. the The eclipse glasses were actually produced so that people could watch the partial phases of the eclipse, and the the total phase of the eclipse is actually completely safe to look at because the entire bright part of the sun is completely covered. So you don't have to worry about uh, about any kind of things like that during the total solar eclipse. In that fact, in 1979, that's what I did. I was, what, seven? And uh, my parents kept me home from school. And uh, we watched the whole eclipse on a black and white TV in their bedroom rather than being locked in the gym and watching it on a color TV at school. You might think I lost out there, but during the total effect phase, which only lasted, what, two minutes and 38 seconds, I think, here in Winnipeg, the um, total phase came into effect. I saw it on TV as this black and white image. Then we knew it was safe to look at. So we opened up the blinds in my parents' room that had been closed. And I looked out and I saw this 
glorious hole in the sky rimmed by blue fire and there was twilight all the way around and the birds were freaking out because they didn't expect it to get dark in the middle of the morning and the whole it was just such an eerie sight and such a beautiful sight and i was gobsmacked i i just i was so amazed it will be the last image that my brain remembers um, even when I've forgotten everything else, it is seared into my memory. It, is, it was such a powerful and beautiful experience. Um, and then as soon as you got to the point where the moon had moved on, you get what's called the diamond ring effect. A little bit of sun starts to appear and that's when you have to immediately look away, put your eclipse glasses back on. And um, that, uh, that gives you the, the good, um, the good view of the rest of the partial phases. Okay, uh, there were some other ones here. Um, let's see. Well, there's quite a lot of, uh, of vitriol um, on the comment phases. For, uh, for those of you that are, uh, that are joining us uh, for the first time, um, this is uh, something that the Manitoba Museum does fairly regularly, and so it's great to great to have you here. Um, please uh, try and keep the comments the, to a sort of a PG thirteen kid friendly kind of level, even on social media. Um, and uh, yeah, so let's let's stay with that. Um, Kylo, yeah, Kylo would ask where to get the eclipse glasses. Um, Kylo asks again, uh, what time can you see Venus and Mercury? um let's see well i saw mercury at 10 o'clock last night it's high enough up that you can wait until it's dark and um that will allow you to uh see it pretty easily venus though you got to get out right at about nine o'clock and it's not going to be dark then so that is uh that is unfortunately something you got to catch very very early Let's see. Um, oh, um, Lou is asking, what is the shelf life of our sun? Well, that's a great question. We believe, uh, first of all, I should say, we've only been studying the sun in detail for you know a few hundred years, and the sun has been around for four and a half billion years. So we've taken a snapshot. And yes, we have a bunch of atomic theory of what's going on in the core, and we have a, we, we've got a lot of scientific instruments and things like that. But um, we can't say 100% for sure in a lot of these things. We believe that the sun will start to run out of uh, its hydrogen fuel in the core a few billion years from now, three, four, five billion years from now, somewhere in there. And when it does that, it starts to swell up and get bigger and turn into what's called a red giant star. And at that point, the Earth is going to not be a good place to live. I'm not too worried about that, not only because I'm not going to be around in five billion years, but I mean, we've only been going into space for what, 70, 80, 75 years, something like that. The first satellite to now, 75 years. And we've already got, people have gone to the moon. We've got a space station with people living on them. In five billion years, we're going to be fine in terms of, you know, if we have to move the Earth somewhere else, no problem. We'll probably be living on a whole bunch of other planets by then. Who knows? Um, but yeah, long, long time. Uh, so we don't have to worry too much about the, the, uh, the sun. And in fact, the sun is remarkably stable, despite the fact that there are these um, sunspots and prominences and there's a, there's a cycle of um, activity that goes up and down. It's a very small amount in terms of the actual energy output. So we really don't have to worry. We're very, very lucky that the sun is like that. So uh, let's see. Um, yeah, we still have arguments online regarding uh, sunspots and um, eclipse glasses. So um, turns out that uh, I've seen sunspots with my unaided eye, with my eclipse glasses. Yes, you need a big one. You won't see all the little ones, but that's the way it, that's the way it is. And they are totally, completely, perfectly safe. In fact, they're the only things that are certified to be safe for uh, viewing of the sun. So um, let's, uh, let's move on from that. Oh, um, 
suggestions on brands and types of binoculars. Yes. Um, telescopes are very hard to find now. We have had an order in since before Christmas that has yet to be filled um, as a as a reseller of telescopes because they're just not available. Some of it is COVID. The factories shut down for a while. Some of it is COVID. People have been at home and are looking for new hobbies. And telescopes are really hard to find. If you if you find a used telescope that you can check out that actually works, scoop it up because they're pretty hard to get right now. Having said that, binoculars, we used to recommend binoculars as a great starting point. Um, and they are in fact, uh, more available, partly because people haven't sort of clued into the fact that you can use them for astronomy. Uh, binoculars are two telescopes, one for each eye, and they give you a really, really good uh, view of a lot of things. The craters on the moon, you can see the moons of the planet Jupiter with a good, good pair of binoculars. You can see um, star clusters, the, the Milky Way in the summertime is beautiful, fantastic stuff. I was I would say that my, I, I'm not worried about brands so much. Most binoculars, you, you kind of get what you pay for. So regardless of who makes it, the $50 binoculars are going to be the same as other $50 binoculars and the $100 binoculars and so on. The, the main thing are the numbers that go with it. And binoculars always have a thing uh, like a number specification, usually 7x50 or something like that. 7x stands for the magnification so seven times magnification is what those binoculars will do and then the 50 is the diameter of the lens of the let's see if i got binoculars sitting no i've moved them to the other spot well here's a little telescope um and this aperture across here is would be the number so this is an 80 millimeter telescope so this is bigger than your than your binoculars um although you can get binoculars this big the bigger the front end the brighter things are um, and the heavier they are. So you really need to sort of balance those out. I find seven by 50 binoculars are perfect. You can hold them handheld. They give a nice wide field of view. The seven times magnification, I find that I can hold steady enough and not see the shaking. Cause you're actually, every time you magnify an image, you're also magnifying your hands moving back and forth or whatever. You can get 10 by 50 binoculars. I find that those ones, the 10 times of the shaking is just a little bit too much for me. So those ones I have to put on a tripod or, or lean my arms on the hood of my car or something like that, depending on where I am. Seven by fifties are great. Um, there's a new set of nine by sixties that I just saw at Canadian Tire a couple of, couple of days ago that I was looking at. I think there were like 150 bucks or something like that. Those are looking interesting as well too. Um, but like I say, brand doesn't matter too much. You should try them out though. You know, make sure that you can get them focused and so on. You don't want to get really, really inexpensive binoculars or, or something like that. You're probably going to need to spend 50, 75 bucks to get a decent pair. Um, so I hope that helps a little bit there, Melissa. Um, and, uh, let's see. Um, oh, Heather has a question here. Do people on the space station see faces of the moon really fast? No, actually, they have the same view that we do here on the Earth. They're only 400 kilometers up from the surface of the Earth. So that is a really, really small amount. Um, it is, uh, I mean, they, they are moving quickly around the Earth, and so they get to see a sunrise and sunset every 95 minutes or, or something like that. But the moon is 100 or 200 and what, 270,000 kilometers away. So 400 out of 270,000 doesn't make a big difference. So they essentially see the same view of the moon that we do here on the earth. Uh, some Facebook questions. And uh, is there any other planets or solar systems that they found that they think humans could eventually live on? Yeah, lots. We have discovered, we, humans have discovered that there are thousands of stars out there that have their own planets. Every star you see at night is a sun. And so they, many of them have planets. Probably half of the stars out there have planets. And we have found dozens of what we call Earth-like planets. They are the, um, they're made of rock. They've got perhaps some kind of atmosphere. They're, um, 
they're they're planets like us as opposed to planets like say the gas giant planets jupiter or the ice dwarf pluto or something like that so there are dozens of those the problem is some of them are too close to their sun so that it would be too hot some of them are too far from their sun it'd be too cold so there's this goldilocks zone you know not too hot not too cold just right and we've found planets in the Goldilocks zone of their solar systems as well. So at the very least, we know that there are planets that we could go to and it wouldn't be too hot or too cold and there'd be something to walk around on and land on and so on. We don't know if there are ones, we can't really tell what kind of atmospheres they have yet. That's right at the edge of what we're able to do. But it is a great um, start because what, 10, 15 years ago, Actually, I, re I remember when I came to my first astronomy day, I asked this very same question and they said, well, we think there's other planets out there and one day we'll discover them. And now we know that there's thousands of them out there. We're going to find so many planets. We're not even going to bother naming them all because there's just going to be too many of them. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, thoughts on spotting scopes. Uh, are they worth the cost? So a spotting scope is like it's kind of halfway between a binocular and a telescope. It's short and portable um, and often um, has sort of a fixed eyepiece. So it's kind of like one half of a pair of binoculars, but it's got more aperture and it's got more magnification. If you have one, use it. The best telescope is the one you've already got. If you don't have one and you're gonna try and take a look at one, um, I've used some spotting scopes and some small scopes in that category that are that are pretty good. Um, they're like binoculars. You kind of get what you pay for. And you need to make sure that um, the mounting that it comes on is pretty sturdy. Because as soon as you get up above 10 or 15 times magnification, you, you have to have them on some kind of tripod. And the tripod has to be able to hold your object, your binoculars or your spotting scope, nice and sturdy. And more importantly, you have to be able to move it nice and smoothly because you have to point your binoculars or your telescope or your spotting scope at something. And that something is in the sky and everything in the sky moves. So you're gonna constantly be adjusting the position of your, of your optical device. And so if the mounting, every time you touch it, it wiggles and you lose your spot, that's not gonna work. Or if it's got these really complicated things so you have to loosen a bunch of screws and then adjust it every time like you're going to be doing that every 45 seconds when you're looking at stuff so the mounting really becomes important for spotting scopes um, I would have said that don't bother with a spotting scope go right to a small Dobsonian telescope uh, a nice smooth um, it's basically a lazy Susan mounting it doesn't have a tripod it's very very low tech but very very easy to use and they have become so inexpensive that it kind of didn't make sense to get a spotting scope when you could get a real telescope now that real telescopes are hard to come by if you spot a spotting scope that that looks good um, tr try it out if you can and uh, you know always feel free to drop me a drop me a line. Uh, I'll put up our links here. There we go. You can, uh, you can find us on Facebook or YouTube through our Manitoba Museum page, or you can email us at space at manitobamuseum.ca. So if you find something and you have a, hey, is this any good question, uh, drop me a line and I'll, uh, I'll try and help you out. Uh, and actually, we, on the same topic, uh, Giuseppe just joined us on Facebook. And Cindy had a question here too. Hi, welcome. Uh, um, oh, I, we got Cindy's. Okay, Giuseppe, uh, I'm new to your program, tuning in for the first time. Suggestions for telescopes for a beginner. Size, magnet, magnification, cost. We, we've been talking a little bit about this. Telescopes right now are almost impossible to get. They have literally been, the world supply has been exhausted right now. And there was a huge delay back in sort of January where the second wave of COVID, when it hit China, the two big factories in China that basically make most of the world's telescopes shut down completely for a couple of months and that backlog still has not cleared so right now if you can find a telescope it's probably because everybody else has decided they don't want that telescope so you might not necessarily want to dive in um you you want to get 
Um, actually, we have a, a thing on the website, uh, the Manitoba Museum website, manitobamuseum.ca. We, we currently can't sell telescopes because we don't have any, but we can, uh, um, we have a sort of a how to buy a telescope um, handout. And it goes through some of the, the spots, the, uh, the details, the specifications and so on. Magnification is not important. Magnification is something that the eyepiece does and you can change eyepieces. That's a, that's a big myth that a lot of people are, are uh, under the misconception of. Magnification totally doesn't matter. In, in fact, when I look at things, I almost never use more than 100 times magnification. Um, with bigger telescopes, you can use more magnification, but with small telescopes, not so much. And you don't need it. Magnification isn't that important. There's uh, Actually, we do a whole course on this, so I can't cover it in, in just a two minute answer. But uh, one thing that I do recommend for people that are just getting into astronomy, there's a great book, it's called Night Watch by Terence Dickinson. It's in its, I think it's fifth or sixth print or edition. It is the best astronomy book for backyard astronomers. It has everything from information on what's in the universe uh, to star maps and a star atlas so you know where to point your telescope. It's got a section on how to choose a telescope and how to use binoculars, a little bit on photography. It's got kind of everything. Um, written by a Canadian uh, author, Terry Dickinson used to, uh, used to do stuff for quirks and quarks on astronomy and stuff like that. Just a great book. I can't recommend it enough. I've seen it at McNally Robinson. I'm sure you can get it pretty much in any bookstore that has a science section. Uh, it's called Night Watch, so just the word night and the word watch, and uh, it's really, the philosophy of the book is great too. Terry coins this great term, naturalists of the night, because when you're out there looking at the stars, I mean, maybe you have a scientific bent and you, and you would like to do research or things like that. There are people that do that as, as uh, backyard astronomers, but by and large, we're out there because it's just fun. It's cool. It's relaxing. It's interesting. It's enjoyable. It really is like going on a nature tour, but your trail is the whole universe instead of just, you know, one small area uh, of, of one small planet in the backwater of the Milky Way galaxy. Not that I'm putting down the naturalists of the day. I'm, I love birding and hiking and all that stuff as well, but I highly um, recommend Night Watch. It's just a great book. So that's a great thing to turn in. Um, Malcolm has just asked, uh, oh, sorry, uh, the, the author of the book is Terence Dickinson. So uh, T-E-R-R-E-N-C-E. -E. And yeah, if you, if you look up Night Watch, you'll, uh, you'll easily find it. It's a, it's a great book. Malcolm's asking about uh, specific brands of telescope and binoculars. Um, oh, I'll see you later, Kylo. Um, and uh and everyone there thanks for thanks for dropping in um as far as telescope brands uh the museum when we started selling telescopes about 10 years ago we settled on orion telescopes and the reason we did that was that we were kind of a lot of people would call us for their first telescope you know once once you've become a hardcore amateur astronomer um, and you specialize and you start to get very detailed tools, you tend to go to different specialized companies and you're not going to come to the planetarium for your, for your gear. But a lot of people would come to us and say, I want my very first telescope, what should I do? And Orion used to win all of the awards for beginner's telescope and good documentation and all that kind of information. It really, they really cater to people that are starting out and their telescopes are designed so that you're getting the most bang for the buck, essentially. You can spend a lot of money on a telescope and you know you wanna make sure that when you spend all that money, you get a good view out of it and you're not spending money on sort of bells and whistles that you don't need. So that's why I, I tend to get uh, Orion stuff. I use all of their stuff. Now, I'll, I'll say though, Orion telescopes and uh, another brand, Skywatcher telescopes, are literally the same telescopes painted different colors when they come out of the factory and different decals put on them. They're, they're identical. They come from the same factory. So Skywatcher is a great um, option as well. They have many of the similar things. I don't find that their documentation is necessarily as beginner focused, but they work really, really well as well. Um, 
Both Celestron and Mead have had some good telescopes uh, over the years. And then there are quite a few more specialized kind of things. But if you're, if you're starting out and you want um, a basic telescope, it's kind of like buying a car. Like, do you, do you buy a Formula One racer for your very first car? Do you buy an 18-wheeler for your first car? No, you probably buy a, a two-door hatchback or a four-door sedan, something pretty basic, right? Um, it was, uh, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing where Orion makes those four-door um, sedans and those two-door hatchbacks really, really well. They also make 18-wheelers and, then, and uh, Formula One racers. But, you know, for the basics, that's, that's what I would recommend. Uh, let's see. Uh, another question comes. Oh, Wesley. Oh, um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The, what, um, you had a six inch telescope that you brought in. It was, I, I remember that you came to one of the, um, the telescope, uh, the telescope courses that we gave, I think. Right. Um, what, uh, what brand of telescope was that? Do you, do you recall? Hmm. Well, I'll let you, uh, I know there's a delay in our in our broadcast, so I'll let you uh, answer the the question if you have a chance. There are a bunch of a bunch of good telescopes out there. The local astronomy club, the RASC, actually has telescopes in their library, and if you're a member, which costs I don't know 80 bucks a year or something like that, you can take them out. Now, unfortunately, right now with COVID, that's sort of suspended. But it's a great way to test drive telescopes. They have six or eight telescopes in the club including one of those specialized solar telescopes that uh, I showed some images of from before. So that's a really good resource too. The Astronomy Club is basically a group of people. There's, what, 230 members here in Winnipeg, five or 6,000 across the country. And they get together once a month and talk astronomy. And it's everything from this is what's in the sky this year and all the way to here's the latest research this week to um, here's pictures that I took with my telescope in my backyard, or here's the new telescope I've got, or here's the robotic observatory that I just built that you can uh, request images on through Twitter. That was actually the talk last night from, uh, from the Astronomy Club. So all sorts of levels, but it's a really good group of people, very welcoming. And uh, if you wanna learn about astronomy and especially once COVID re uh, restrictions are relaxed, if you wanna get out and do astronomy with people that know more than you do it's a great uh, resource so that's the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada or RASC and if you go to rasc.ca that's the website and you can sign up online you can um, join the Winnipeg Center or another center if you're watching us from somewhere else I think there are what 30 centers across the country and most of the big cities have them and uh, yeah, it's a it's a great resource. Um, I've, I've been a member since I was 16, I think, and it is a fantastic group of people. And most of the stuff that I learned about telescopes and things like that pretty much came from joining the RASC. OK, we're coming up on eight o'clock. We are going to be taking a break. We'll come back at nine o'clock. And at nine, I'm hoping we will have some live images to show you of Mercury and Venus and the Moon. If not, we'll be back doing some more questions and I'll have some pre-recorded images as well as a few other things that we can talk about. So um, thanks, for, uh, thanks for coming for our first session. Those of you that have joined us, hope you, fo hopefully you can make it back at nine o'clock or whatever. Um, if not, we'll see you again. Remember Thursday nights, seven o'clock central. And uh, it was really nice to see all of our regular folks and uh, everyone that came out. So I'll see you again in about an hour, same place. And uh, hopefully we'll have some clear skies. Thanks for coming out. Bye-bye.